<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. Welcome to the show. An interesting week shaping up here uh, in the absence of big splash economic data out of the U.S., but not without volatility. Uh, we talked about the Australian dollar and the RBA yesterday. That was a surprise that got the currency moving. Perhaps we'll get some more action today as we turn our attention to China. We're going to have a, a bunch of economic data hitting the wires from China this week. We begin with the first batch today. And of course, as ever, asking the question, what is going on with this global recession that everybody uh, is increasingly worried about uh, and how does the world's second largest economy fit into that story uh, is it going to be a positive note a negative one uh, and how do we extend whatever's going on here into trading assets what does it mean for stocks what does it mean for currencies commodities and so forth. So, first and foremost, let's have a look at what is actually expected here. This is the breakdown. You can see the balance of trade expected to come in at 95 and a half billion that's in u.s dollar terms that will be a little bit of an improvement over the 90.2 billion uh, that was recorded in april so a bit of a wider surplus here for china but unfortunately not for good reasons uh, consider what is going on on the flows here so exports seen falling 1.8 uh percent imports seen falling eight percent so what we immediately find here is the reason that the balance of trade surplus is expected to be wider is because the way that that's calculated is the difference between exports and imports and imports are seen falling much harder here than exports Eight is a lot bigger than 1.8. And so ostensibly the reason that the surplus is going to get bigger isn't the good kind of surplus increase where exports accelerate. No, they're both falling. It's just imports are going to, um, based on these expectations, fall faster. Not the best news for domestic demand, certainly. Uh, but it looks like the story not all that encouraging and this is really why we care you can see here the u.s comprises about a quarter of the global economy the eurozone is about 15 percent china is nearly a fifth of global gdp so what happens in china is a very big input into the overall global growth story where of course we continue to watch for a slowdown because central banks have spent the past year aggressively raising interest rates certainly led by the fed and uh, most recently um, with a top up from the rba just overnight that is of course meant to bring global inflation down it's currently averaging about seven percent worldwide most central banks have a target of around two to three and so clearly most global central banks are on a mission to slow the global economy to bring that inflation down there was some disinflation that was had from improving supply chains uh, as more and more economies reopened after covid and uh, there was more of an adjustment uh, made there where goods that uh, were perhaps disrupted in their supply and the disconnect between supply and, uh, and and demand there was feeding inflation that looks to have been addressed at this point looking at um, shipping costs back down to pre-pandemic levels looking at the cost of distributing intermediate goods around their various final markets we can see that supply chain bottlenecks as an inflationary influence have largely gone away and so now the question isn't so much 
how do we improve the supply of goods to meet demand? It's how do we slow demand? And that, of course, is a story about interest rate hikes bringing global growth to a more uh, defensive posture. And needless to say, now that we have the U.S. debt ceiling debacle out of the way, now that the banking crisis seems to be so something like back burner in terms of uh, the range of risks, nothing has gone immediately wrong um, for a bit here. And so the markets are understandably shifting their focus to global growth and saying, well, to get from seven to something like two or three, how much economic pain is going to get inflicted? How bad is it going to hurt? Are we going to get a broad-based recession? What is that going to mean? This, by the way, is the share of exports and imports as a kind of cumulative volume in Chinese GDP. So you can see it is a fifth of the global economy, and trade, even after the indignities of these lockdowns uh, last year, which you can see significantly shaved the trade contribution uh, to China's GDP, still looking like about a third of Chinese uh, activity growth comes from the trade side before this self-inflicted wound of zero uh, COVID uh, policy, it was more like 40%. So we're looking at uh, clearly an economy very dependent on trade flow and where that trade flow seems to be suffering. Here's the trend into which these numbers are going to be coming out. There's the 8% uh, decline in imports, the 1.8% uh, decline in exports that are expected. Uh, and you can see here that the trend really since the beginning of last year has been lower for both. You get a bit of a reopening bump as you start this year. You can see it happens in imports first. Not surprising, of course, because that's where you get the uh, – people that have been stuck in lockdowns this entire time um, proceeding, finally getting the opportunity to sort of re-engage. Uh, and so you get a bit of a bump in domestic demand. You see something similar in, in PMI numbers as well. Uh, the export side is a little bit more lagged. There uh, you get a bump a, a little bit later as external demand rebuilds and the capacity to fill it rebuilds and now both appear to be in retreat this is in part as we just mentioned a, a function of the global story so in the orange line there uh, just as a proxy for um, in, inflation fighting efforts by central banks because of course the fed has been the most aggressive there is the active Fed funds futures contract implied rate. And there you, you, you just get a sense for expectations for Fed tightening. You can see February of last year is where the bottom is. The first hike is in March. And you can see as these rate hikes build, so too global trade volumes come down. This is, of course, because what's occurred here with these rate hikes is the cost of financing any which form of economic activity has gone up and has gone up very quickly and by a lot. So consider that the lead time, let's say, on shipping iPhones uh, to an Apple store somewhere in middle America is probably somewhere in the vicinity of at least a few quarters because it would take quite a bit of time to get those things built, figure out how much of them are going where, have those things arrive there, have them be sold. Obviously, there's a degree of credit deployment that needs to happen there. So, the orders 
the building of inventory, all the shipping of that inventory, all of that has to be paid for before these things are sold. And so there is a natural desire then to use credit and basically say, we're good for these things, send them as they are sold, the, 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 there will be the covering of that credit. Now consider that financing that inventory, the cost of doing that went up anywhere between four to 500% over the course of a year. Whereas the lead times to being thinking about how much one needs to finance relative to when that stuff would uh, invariably arrive is probably about half a year, if not longer. And so what we're looking at is, on the one hand, a slow absorption of these higher rates, but on the other hand, a very significant impact and a very quick change in how much it costs to do business. So not surprisingly, what's occurred here, albeit with a bit of a lag, is the deceleration of global economic activity as captured in the, the cumulative trade volumes that we see here. So part of what we see occurring in China, part of what's going on here is just global factors, central banks tightening up demand. But that's not all. There is also a China-specific element where its share of global trade volumes has actually started to trend down and has been since really the beginning of uh, this COVID epidemic. Episode. You can see, in particular, most recently, the share of exports, China's share of global export f flows, has dropped to just 12%, having been closer to 15 a mere quarter ago. The share of imports has been moving lower, uh, a, a little bit more modestly, from about 13 to about 10. But nevertheless, the trend in China's participation in global trade has been weakening. If we look at how that compares with its share of the overall pie, we can see that China's share of global trade cumulatively going into the pandemic was at about 15 percent, now stands at about 11.2. And although uh, it seems to be uh, basically back to f flat in terms of the growth rate, we can see that the deceleration has really tracked what's going on globally, but has had some significant underperformance. So we can see here that for all of last year, re really, the red line that you see on your chart is under the blue line which is telling you that the growth rate in trade globally, or in this case, the deceleration and eventual contraction in it, have outperformed what's going on in China. That where we've seen positive growth, China has grown slower than the average. And where we flipped below zero and entered into contraction mode in the back half of last year going into this year, we have China shrinking faster than the world average, really until uh, ab about February or so. And there we have a little bit of a reconnecting. Now, where is this coming from? Well, we can see here why this is occurring. These are composite PMI indices. And what you see here is that you have the peak in the post-COVID reopening bump 
for China's main export markets, the U.S., the Eurozone, so the end demand uh, parts of our story here. Back in the first and second half of 2021, respectively, so uh, the peak in U.S. growth coming out of COVID, May of 2021, where that giant pile of stimulus that the U.S. deployed really uh, crested in terms of its positive influence on growth. You see something similar in the Eurozone in July of 2021. And from there, over the course of the rest of that year and last year, the trend is down. What you're looking at is deceleration because, of course, central banks are doing what we've just described to slow global growth. So what you see here, and in the logic of PMIs, just uh, as a, a reminder, values above 50 represent growth, values below 50 represent contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. So. What you see in looking at um, the U.S. here, the composite PMI, and the Eurozone, the blue line, uh, also the composite uh, PMI, is from about the middle of 2021, give or take a month in either direction, a month earlier in the case of the U.S., a month later in the case of the Eurozone. From that point onward, you have lower values, which come the uh, second half of last year, start to dip under 50. So what you have is a trend toward decelerating and in parts contracting economic activity growth in services and manufacturing sectors in the world's largest and demand economies. Now, China is on lockdown for most of this. The reopening doesn't really start until December of last year. And so what you see is, here's the re reopening there marked as December of 2022. You can see that's where you get a bit of a bump to economic activity. You see it in both the official and the Kaishin numbers. Uh, the official numbers, the CFLP numbers, come from uh, government agencies uh, in China. Uh, the Kaishin version of the PMI data set comes from S&P Global. It's a, a private sector estimate that basically seeks to do the same thing. Sometimes it overshoots, sometimes it undershoots the official numbers. You can see most recently here, it's been just a tad more optimistic. But what you're looking at in broad strokes is a Chinese economy dependent on the external sector, as we've just discussed, though it is, reopening into a global slowdown. So we have here uh, the reopening in December, the slowdown st starting essentially a year and a half before then. And so by the time China rejoins or starts to rejoin its part of the global supply chain in earnest, you get a situation where the uh, markets go well. It's all well and good that you're here to service our, our uh, intermediate goods and supply needs, but our needs aren't there to the extent that you'd like to service them. Demand has been slowing for a year and a half. Interest rates are relatively high. The demand is just not there. And that really is why we're seeing what we're seeing in China. This is why its share of exports and imports has declined. This is why uh, it's mostly underperformed against global averages and why its share of the global economic pie has been reduced from 15 to 11. It has missed a huge part of the reopening. It's come to the party late. And at this point, it's finding it hard to convince the rest of the global 
supply chain that what they should do is go back to business as usual. In looking at the kind of broader sweep then of economic data, that sort of sets us up for why there is weakness in the space. Looking at uh, Chinese economic data more generally, you can see the zero COVID reopening marked there. It looked like uh, the incoming e economic data really started to reflect that reopening from about the middle of January. That's not unusual, uh, of course, because what we're talking about is economic data, which is because of the time it takes to gather it, collate it, release it, so forth, is inherently lagged. Um, and changes in the economy, of course, happen in real time. So not surprisingly, if the reopening started, let's call it early December, you start to see the dividend from it, give or take six weeks later. But what we find is that it has already run its course looking at the economic data evolving thereafter. You can see a peak in the data flow in about mid-April, and if we consider the lags uh, in the process here, then one would assume that actual economic activity peaked before you saw that turn. And the degree to which economic data has uh, outperformed relative to forecasts has collapsed basically to nothing. So at this stage, you can see the index has retreated to the lowest levels it's seen since the start of that uh, post reopening recovery. So definitely not encouraging news in terms of the relationship between analyst economic models and reality, with those models looking rosier than reality is validating. And so with that in mind, we run inherently the risk of a downside surprise. Now, if we get weaker trade numbers than what is already anticipated in this larger environment, it would be for the global reasons that we've just discussed. And if that's the case, well, then that's certainly a worrying sign, considering that downbeat data here would speak to weaker conditions in an economy that is 19% of global G, uh, GDP than perhaps markets have anticipated. That would be something that would translate into a weaker business cycle more generally for the global economy as a whole. Now, from central banks' perspective, maybe that helps with disinflation. But from the growth perspective, from the earnings perspective, this amounts to a significant risk on the table, whereby if these numbers come in particularly weak, the implication would be that the global economy is much more hampered than economists anticipated, and that going forward, we have a much less constructive sort of perspective on things that are inherently growth-linked, be they stocks, the Aussie dollar, the Kiwi dollar, the Canadian dollar, the commodities underlying a lot of these um, cyclically-minded uh, currencies, certainly crude oil, copper, um, and um, of course, when we look at equities, we're looking at something that's inherently growth sensitive because uh, equities, all things um, aside, derive their ultimate valuation from expectations for earnings. And earnings come from economic growth. They come from people being employed, from having money, from spending that money on stuff, and for companies then being able to derive margins from selling that stuff. So we are in a uh, situation here then where if the data is disappointing, the expectation will be that all these cyclical things are in greater danger and look relatively expensive compared to what they appeared like before the data crossed the wires. On the flip side of uh, the spectrum, the assets that would tend to do well in this kind of uh, scenario are, of course, bonds, 
because they would anticipate a uh, reduced scope for the Fed to raise rates in an environment that's relatively rosy, perhaps more uh, of a rate cut bias than is already there could get priced back in. A lot of the rate cuts that were baked in for the back half of this year already gone after the resolution of uh, the debt ceiling situation. But nevertheless, if this process is going to uh, continue, there is a lot more to be said here, and needless to say, China is a huge input. So if we get that soft result, then you, you get that negative response from risk, but the likes of the dollar, the likes of the yen probably do a bit better in that you might have, with a soft number, a bit less scope for a further uh, hike, let's say from the Fed or another major central bank. If you have perhaps less scope for rates to remain higher for longer, that might be a positive knock to bonds, a bit of a headwind for yields, and by extension, a lift to gold, which doesn't yield anything and so tends to do well when yields are falling because the opportunity cost to owning it is declining with them and vice versa. So that is the lens here from these Chinese um, trade numbers. Now, uh, I mentioned that there's a, a bit more Chinese data on the docket. Later in the week, we are also going to look at CPI numbers, uh, another very important gauge of Chinese um, economic activity growth, because again, we're talking about a fifth of the global economy here, so this is very, very important. We'll look at those later in the week and see what they are setting up uh, to show us in the context of what we see here. The, the trade balance numbers, though, certainly something with potential to move the needle on market sentiment. And that is macro money for today. As ever, I am here Monday through Thursday for this show. Uh, and that, that comes out right after Overtime, a show I do with Chris Vecchio, head of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live, covering that day's events and uh, trying to make sense of what's going on uh, in markets uh, and what's moving them and where they might go next across assets. Uh, I'm back on with Chris on Friday for Futures Power Hour. I'm on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sunday evenings as the markets come to life in APAC hours. And outside of those shows, I am opining on Twitter at Ilya Spivak. Thank you very much for joining everybody. Good luck out there. Macro Money will be back tomorrow. In the meantime, take care.